You are listening to the Hiking Radio Network, where we talk the walk with shows by hikers about hikers for everybody. Mighty Blue on the Appalachian Trail, the ultimate midlife crisis. Join Steve and his guests every week as he staggers from Georgia to Maine. Hi guys, it's me again, Mighty Blue. And you're listening to Mighty Blue on the Appalachian Trail, the ultimate midlife crisis. This is episode number 349 of the show. And today we have a guest that I found on Facebook. Her name is Lauren Adamzak, or Airbag. And I reached out to her because of a post that she made on Facebook that I found very touching. I'm not going to spoil the story by telling you why that was. You'll just have to find out in a few moments. Also today, we have our first male member of the Mighty Blue Class of 2023. Just when I was despairing that we'd get any blokes on the show for this section, four came along at once. Today, we have on Steve Cordekamp, a retired firefighter, who has decided to put his life on hold to follow his own dream next year. Steve will be on after Lauren. Then, in George Stephanus's Then the Hell Came, George starts to articulate the ways in which the trail is changing him, recognising, as the majority of us do that you can't go on a six-month or so hike and come back the same person. It took George a while to come to that conclusion, but he starts talking about it today. Just before we get to meet Lauren, I wanted to clear something up that may have confused a few of you who listened to Anna Huthmaker's Trail Days podcast on Tuesday. This week, Anna refers to a new Hiking Radio Network shop and the various items of merch that you can get there. Well, <laughs> you will be able to, but I haven't actually opened the shop yet, I'm just finishing it off. It's going to be called HRN Trading Post, and I'll be posting about it on Facebook when I'm finally done tweaking the various bits. Look out for it, though. I think some of you are going to like it. Now, let's meet Lauren Adamzak, or Airbag. I found today's guest while I was scrolling through Facebook. This is Lauren Adamzak, or Airbag. Hey, Lauren, how are you? I'm doing great. How are you? Good. Now, I want to start with the post that I found on Facebook. And it did touch me in a way that I didn't quite expect it to when I started reading it. It was so positive. So congratulations for that. Thank and you. I'm going to read it so uh, we, we can then talk on the other side. You wrote, my, and you put inverted commas, my original name was Lauren. There I was, the quiet 30-year-old that never spoke up in groups, often looked down at the ground in public and wouldn't dare leave the house <laughs> in mismatched clothes. <laughs> That made me laugh. Well, after four days on the AT, I accepted the trail name Airbag. Yes, Airbag. I thought I'd have a more majestic and woodsy trail name like Feather or Firefly, but those names wouldn't have fit. I had no idea how much I would come to fully embrace Airbag and all that it stands for, which is to fully live life, be goofy and weird, act like a fool, and also trip over yourself a lot. It didn't take much time or deliberation to decide I wanted to through hike the AT. I just made the decision one day like, yeah, I'm going to do that thing. And this is when I'm going to do it. I'd never gone backpacking. I'd never slept in a shelter or shit in the woods. And I'd hiked here and there, but I'd never walked with a pack on my back. I didn't make it to Katahdin. Even after COVID took me out, I returned to the trail. But after three weeks back on trail, I still had not returned to the hiker I was before I got sick, and I ended my hike in early August after 990 miles. I'm just now coming to terms with what is and what isn't. Returning to the Matrix is tough, as we all know. For me, it felt even tougher than the hike. 80 hikers share something special no one back home seems to understand, and that can feel isolating and lonely. But the trail sure had an effect on me. At least here I feel heard and understood. Congratulations and good luck to the AT class of 2022. I look at each and every summit photo for familiar faces. I did that in 2019, yeah. by the way. Uh, and to everyone I called Tramley at some point or other, thank you for sharing your hike, wisdom and stories with me. Stay feral, everybody. Love and gratitude, airbag. And I love the ending, by the way. Stay feral, everyone. <laughs> so, so let's talk about it now bit by bit. You say... You were a quiet 30-year-old, never spoke up in groups, often looked to the ground in public and wouldn't dare leave the house in mismatched clothes. Tell me some more about her and how the, how she plucked up the courage to step on trail. Ooh, I am not sure how. Um, hadn't really given that much thought. Um, 
That's why I never give anybody the questions in advance. Right. <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, I definitely, there were a lot of life changes that happened before going out. And I think just when things start to fall away, it kind of gives you like, well, you've got nothing else to lose. So go ahead and yeah, try it. You had a tough year, didn't you? In the in the year in front of just before the trial. Tell, tell us what happened. Yeah. Um, so I uh, had the summer before the trail, I'd gotten divorced. I had mm. moved. Um, really the last thing. Oh, I all, there was also um, before the divorce, like I went through a health struggle. And um, honestly, that that was probably the one of the first kind of triggers because I wanted to be out doing what I loved and I couldn't at the time. So sure. you got to do it when you can, I think is what is what I'm saying. And um, yeah, and the last thing was obviously I, I, I did resign from my position to go hike. So that was oh. Oh right, right. But that, yeah, that was for the hike. So that, 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 <laughs> that is different. a bit. Of, that is a bit of a commitment. So you yeah. were this. You were this person who, because one of the things you said said to to me in one of our conversations when we first spoke before, you you suddenly discovered it. I think while you were going traveling to work or reading reading it somewhere, mm -hmm. and you thought that sounds great, but I couldn't do that. Why did yeah. you think you that thirty year old Lauren couldn't do that? I don't know. Um... I, I mean, I, I, it wasn't necessarily because I knew I had never gone and done an overnight backpacking trip. So it wasn't that. I think there was, and I think there was some bit of a curiosity and an interest there. Um, it's, it sounded like a very intense, a very intense thing to do. And it is, and, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, it is. Um, and I, I think I needed to learn that. I had a strength that I could use out there. I didn't think that I had that before when right. I had that thought that sure. oh, I couldn't do that. But you made, you, you decided that's what you wanted to do. And then you started thinking, and this always happens to people, by the way, they always think about it more and more and it just kind of takes off in their head, doesn't it? Yeah. So how did that kind of grab hold of you? Was that really something that turned into a real strong desire to go out there? Somehow it did. <laughs> um, give it enough time. I mean, I think it maybe took two or three years before I made that decision. So the shy thirty-year-old Lauren got on trail, and it was only four after four days that you accepted. What is, to be fair, not the loveliest <laughs> trail name of all. Um, why were you called that? And who was that woman? Yeah. As opposed to the woman you were before, just in four days, by the way. Yeah. So, okay. So my name could sometimes be misunderstood when I, when I tell people, you know, what my trail name is, but the story behind it, um, was we encountered a storm, uh, going up over, I think the mountain was actually big cedar. I don't know if anyone remembers the names of them, but I remembered that one. And so, yeah, call, call it sassafras. There were about 20 sassafras mountains there. So <laughs> it, it could have been sassafras. Yeah. It was the day. I think it was the day after. All right, um, good. yeah. So we had a rainstorm and I was like, woefully, underprepared with it. I didn't really have actual rain gear. I had this green poncho. It was basically like a trash bag that I fit <laughs> over myself in my pack. And it just, the, it's windy up on those mountains. So you get a nice gust of wind, all the rain comes in, but it poofed me up like a bag of air. So that's how, um, <laughs> that's how I got the name. We're going to come back to your your preparations because, you know, your poncho wasn't the only mistake you made in terms of gear, but we'll talk yeah. about that yeah. uh, in a minute. And, by then, when you accepted that name, which, as you say, you know, it wasn't necessarily the, the folksiest name you could have got, um, did you notice then that you were transitioning to Airbag? Or did, did and this, this may sound a stupid question, and I apologise if it does, but did, the, did Lauren deliberately not turn up at Springer? Did you try to turn up as a different version of yourself? Or did that just happen as soon as you got out there? I think there was something in my head that, so I think what would be, I think when accepting the, the name, I right. think I grew into it. Right. But I think maybe I guess I felt like I would. <laughs> it shows like, I mean, I think deep down there like is a sense of humor and, and, and not minding standing out. I knew it would be a unique name. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah. <laughs> and, and that stay feral thing, you, you, I think you learn that pretty quickly. The feral, the feral lifestyle 
Now, I, I remember thinking to myself, how are these women? I mean, perhaps it's sexist to me, and I'm, I'm not, I don't intend to be, but uh, how are these women putting up with this? I mean, as guys, we can put up with any sort of crap, can't we? <laughs> but women tend not, I thought, would not like that. But I found the women I met in 2014 and 2018, 2019 rather, both absolutely embraced that lifestyle. What was it like for you? I noticed the same thing. I, some of the um, other women hikers I met out there, I mean, we we were the first that, of the people that I knew to do a night hike. Right. Um, All right, we, yeah, yeah, yeah we, we enjoyed the night hike. <laughs> I would never do that. <laughs> um, yeah, just embracing it. And, always, and, and there was always like a positive energy about whatever was going on and just took it in stride. Yeah, funny enough, we, I've just recently spent a weekend at Woods Hole, uh, uh, one of the hostels on the trail, and and it was one of the things that struck me immediately, which I didn't recognise in myself, I don't think, when I was doing it, the incredible positivity of all the young, particularly the younger people, on the trail, and how they were just having a blast out there. Did you find yourself, once you were within that group of people, getting into it straight away, or, or was that reserved nature that you say you have, was that was that holding you back to start with or did you throw yourself into it i i think i threw myself into it I, but i think people notice a difference so i am definitely more of an introvert but mm -hmm. i'm an introvert that likes hanging out with extroverts um, oh, really? so i found like my extroverted group and they kind of bring that out of me and we would meet other hikers and they would pick up on like one of these is not like the others. <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> yeah, they noticed it a little bit. Yeah, I was, I was still a little bit more, yeah, the quiet, more quiet one. But I had a great time. So was it with them? Was it you or your surroundings or the company that facilitated that change? Was it a, was it that feeling that a lot of us get when we go on the trail? We can literally present whatever we want of ourselves, can't we? And that's a very liberating feeling. It is. I. I, I definitely got the sense that, you know, I, I don't think I really, ch I don't think I changed. I think that it allow gives you the freedom to really be yourself and you don't, you're not trying to fit any sort of predefined persona. I just felt more free to like be more me. I knew it must've been somewhere there already. Right. Of course it must have been. Yeah, yeah. you just you, you freed yourself up to do things which you, which you might not otherwise have done. I, I, I did exactly the same. Not that I'm a shy person. I never was shy. But it was something that does allow you, and I think it's the trail name that does it. That's what, that's what really struck me about it. your trail name. It was a, it's a, a strange trail name, but, you know, you, you embraced that trail name. It allowed you to, be, to fall over, trip over a lot, um, act like a fool, be goofy and weird. All those things were things you probably wanted to do but have never felt perhaps the, uh, the freedom to do it. So, and I know that's what the trial can do to you as well. So tell us though, how you actually made that snap decision to go and move out of your life as a 30 year old, I presume in a career, and you say you quit, quit that job, um, to go into a life on trail. And what did your friends and your family think about you doing that? Um, so the decision, I feel like I've made the decision um, very quietly, meaning like I was the only person that knew Oh, right. I was going to do it for, it was about a year before I had asked. Oh, really? So, yeah. I think, now, I, think now, I knew for. Now, why is that? Was that because in case you changed your mind, you didn't want to, because once you say Oh, it, why I didn't say you, it? Yeah. Why you going to, because once you say you're going to do it, you're kind of committed, aren't you? Um, yeah, I think I did. I think I was a little nervous about the reaction. So I just wanted to kind of keep it under wraps until I was, definitely like on track to go there was going to be no talking me out of it and they noticed you had a backpack on and things like that <laughs> i mean did, <laughs> so when did you actually tell them and how long before you went so i think it was just just the winter just the just i don't know oh, it right. could have been december january right so that, that, that so your friends and family yeah. have plenty of time to react so how did they react um so it was it was kind of mixed actually the people i feel like those that were closest to me had the strongest like more anti-hike reaction <laughs> based on what they knew about me because they care for you that's why yeah oh, oh hang on that, that because they thought you couldn't cope with it maybe i mean i got questions like well what are you going to do when it's rain like rainy and muddy and you know i'm gonna you, buy a useless you know poncho i'm gonna, I'm gonna <laughs> buy an absolutely useless poncho is what you should have said yeah <laughs> 
Yeah, so, yeah. So um, actually, so uh, I to- I also waited for a long to tell friends even longer. I mean, I think that was maybe for for some that were closest to me, maybe it was like a month out, and then those who I wasn't as close with, I kind of let it just. I didn't. I I basically posted on social media after I had already left from. Oh, oh, right. <laughs> Guess what I'm doing now. Yeah, very yeah, cool. <laughs> I'm here. <laughs> so how did you prepare? Did you need need to prepare physically? Obviously, you needed to buy gear. You obviously did research. So tell us how you went about it. Um, so I, because I had that initial curiosity a couple of years before, there was a good amount of time spent in the years leading up just watch, like I was watching videos, sure. trying to learn what the day-to-day is like. Um, and I, I did slowly start to get some gear. I got the pack, one, of, which is not even the right order to do it in, <laughs> but I got the pack first. It was too small. I ended up getting a larger one before I went out. Excellent. Um, yeah. <laughs> but yeah, I was starting to, and I got trekking poles and, um, slowly started to build, uh, you know, my kit. So how did you prepare? Cause I think you said you did a, a shakedown hike for four days. Was mm-hmm. it in Arkansas? Yeah, it was. How, the how, how did that go? Trail. How did that go? It went. I would say it went well. I had a great time. It right. solidified. It was kind of like I knew I was going to. I, I'd already kind of made the decision I was going to do the AT. So this was kind of I don't know. It kind of confirmed that and confirmed that I was right in what I wanted to do. And it was a little bit. We did some challenging mileage for what the trail, what that trail is. Mm -hmm. Um, we were shooting for sometimes somewhere between 10 and 12 mile days. That's a lot. Um, it's a very, very, yeah, Yeah, it's not like it's, it's like the rocky sections of the AT, not the path sections. (laughs) And I did, yeah, I did end up hurting my knee on that, on that trip. And, uh, Kind of so you knew you were ready to go. Yeah. <laughs> so you knew you were ready to go because you hurt your knee. So, so despite your four days, and you went out there, and you it was, you probably walked longer than you should have walked mm-hmm. for those first few days. Did you feel that this was a life that you could live, though? Because it is, you know what it's like—a you know, full six month hike or whatever it's going to be. And in your case, it was about a thousand miles. But did you think that was a life you could really enjoy? I did, I, especially given what we did in those four days i knew that i was trying to keep up with the group too so i'm like if i can go out and and as they say hike your own hike on the yeah. at um take it at a pace at a slower pace to start not injure myself um because i hiked the last day maybe 10 miles it was the the knee was 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 giving me some trouble but i but after all of that and wanting to stay out there i think I got really emotional driving away and I, and I was just oh, nice. so excited to, to do the same thing kind of over again. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's good. It's good. You had that. I think it's important to have a shakedown hike. I, everybody knows on this show, I never prepare for anything. I didn't, for my second hike through hiking 2019, I didn't pack until the morning I flew to Atlanta. I hadn't packed my pack at all, which is ridiculous. I know I'm just so unprepared. Now you mentioned your rain gear. Um, you said you'd done research, but you hadn't researched very well because you got a poncho. But you, it wasn't just your rain gear, was it? You had a few issues with your shoes, didn't you? Mm-hmm. Tell us about that. Um, I, I, I know you can't always expect to get shoes right on the first try. So this was no. my second try, my second pair of hiking shoes. I did go with um, trail runners. Mm-hmm. Um, they were La Sportiva. They were because I was looking for something meant for narrow feet. I have narrow feet okay. and shoes will slip on my heels. Um, they seemed to be really good. After 100 miles, though, I started to get some pretty bad. I mean, they were blisters taking up my entire heel cup, and they were they calloused over, so I couldn't. Um, I had difficulty draining, keeping them uh-huh. drained. They just oh, kind of kept coming back. And I don't know why I did this in retrospect I should have changed the shoes I kept hiking in them until Damascus <laughs> so yeah, from, yeah your, your shoes are hurting all yeah. the way to Damascus 
excellent. That's the, that, that is definitely <laughs> not the way to do it, by the way. Because you did say to me when I took my notes, you said to me before mm. that you were mad at you were mad at your feet for hurting, for hurting. Not, mad, no. not mad at your shoes, mad at your feet. That's, yeah, that's I could impressive. stand to be a little. I that's something I learned out there too. I could stand to be a little nicer to myself, and I heard myself like saying that in my head, and I was like, hmm. Well, give you know, yourself a break. Give yourself that? a break. Yeah. Yeah, quite right. So, and the people who named you pulled ahead of you after a while because were you try, were they going faster than you generally or they just pulled ahead then because you know what it's like it's a fluid thing it's very dynamic isn't it the trial yeah. people get into groups and they get out of groups how did yeah. that work hiked out with the hiked with the group um met met them at the first it was the shelter just before the actual trail um oh, wow. so still on the approach All right um got to neil neil's gap and then i think a couple of day, a couple of days after that was when they, they, they did get ahead, right. kind of there. But did you was it important to you to be in a group, or did you like any time by yourself? Um, I def I liked being with the group. I and I learned. I think I learned that too. Um, but I did also tell myself that I wasn't going to change my pace too much to yeah. stick with one. You should not be hiking anybody else's hike other than your yeah. own. And you should only hike with a group, I think, if that pace is comfortable mm -hmm. for you. Not worry about whether you're staying up with them or not. But then you got COVID. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, and I, I've not thought about that really. I know that in 2020, COVID happened, started rather, and people there were there were fewer people on trial, but still people kept kept going. But you must have discovered you had it on on trail. And you must have been in close contact with other people as well at the same time, haven't you? So what's it like to discover it on trail? And did you um, try to follow up with other people to see if it impacted any of them as well? So it took – so it's weird how it happened mm -hmm. because I I actually – so the, I'll just – I'll go in chronological story order here. I I was doing okay. I got to Virginia and my mileage took a hit. Um, I wasn't, I was generally, I just was feeling like I wanted to sleep a lot. Um, I was definitely fatigued. Um, so my mileage dropped and that was like the first sign to me that something probably wasn't right, but I was thinking maybe it was like the diet, the poor nutrition out there, um, tested negative. I didn't have like any of any other symptoms. Oh, so you did test. So you did test mm -hmm. yeah, straight away. Yeah. Okay. But I was lucky enough that. Um, I had a family member driving down to swap out some gear with me uh -huh. and I decided when they were there that I was going home, um, it to sleep, I guess, right. <laughs> like maybe I'll sleep yeah. and I'll get back out. Yeah, yeah. Um, was that the intention to go home and, and sleep? Pretty much. Um, right. I, it's like, I, I like something that my body wants me to rest. Sure. So, um, went home and then within two or three days, I got, I took a test twice. The first one was negative and then the second one the next oh. day. Maybe on the third day was, then it showed up. You might have called it from somebody at home. <laughs> you never know, do you? Yeah. I mean, did you, I, ever, did you ever see that trap, the family members again? Did you tell people you had COVID at all later on? Um, yeah, they, they, they knew. Um, oh. yeah. Okay. So as you said, you, you got back on. Um, you went home. Um, you, did you? Where did you get back on? And did you think you're okay to continue at that stage? Had that had that lethargy gone away, or was it still there? Because you because somewhere somewhere you said you weren't the same hiker that you've been before. Yeah. So tell us about that. It was still there, but it was it felt really unpredictable. So like I didn't really. It wasn't. I wouldn't say it was always always there. So I never knew what each day would feel like for me, and that was hard to deal with because I couldn't really plan out what my, what my mileage would be for the day. But course, I got yeah. back on in Palmerton, in Pennsylvania. Right. Well, that lovely um, climb, lovely climb up the rocks. I lost. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I wanted favorite, to see that. Place. Yeah. Yeah. At that point, I felt like I would fall in quite. I was I was off the trail for maybe ten or twelve days. Right. Right. So you were back on. Back in. So you were back on by yourself, were you? Did you go back on by yourself? Oh uh, no, I actually I was hiking with someone there. Right. Um, we we ran into like a bunch of and I ran into a bunch of people that I remember seeing before I got off, and they were oh, there. All right. Oh, right. So yeah, they were they were passing me by though. 
because <laughs> I, I wasn't doing more than like five to seven miles. Because if you're restarting after 10 days off, yeah. you don't lose your legs totally, but you, it is certainly tiring to get back into it, I, I know. And you said that you um, you accepted that you um, weren't the same sort of hiker that, that you had been before you got off. When you actually got off the trail and you – I don't know why you didn't do another 10 miles, by the way, make it a 1,000 miles, because it was 990 miles, wasn't it? <laughs> 990. I guess I post, put in the post 990, because I was, I don't know why. I, I counted 994. Okay, 994. I was six miles away. <laughs> so when you got off trail, so, uh, and by the way, what precipitated the decision to get off trail? The fact that you weren't enjoying it, or you just couldn't hike longer miles? It didn't even feel like, this is what was weird about it. It didn't even really feel like it was a decision. It was just, I had, I, I had no intention of, of actually ending my hike there. Right. Um, I was a little bit past like the Bear Mountain area. Uh-huh. Yeah. And I had a just really rough day. I, and, and if I look back, it, it definitely looks like classic symptoms of heat exhaustion, but it also, heat exhaustion has almost identically overlapping symptoms with post-COVID fatigue. So right. it's like, to oh. me, I'm like, well, who knows? It's one or the other. What, or, maybe, right. or, maybe, or both. Or maybe even both. Yeah, yeah. it might even have been both. Yeah. I was hiking. I've been like 15 minutes, take a break, little little chunks to go. It took a very long time to go about three miles yeah. to a road to basically I felt I should get out of the heat, um, went into town to cool off and um, called, called my trusty dad who is my family's from long island so they're not too far away um saying like i, I i'm gonna take another break and that was it but yeah i had no idea that I was not gonna go back after that so when you got off trail after say say a thousand miles did that feel like a failure to you or did it feel like an accomplishment because just before you ask the question is absolutely an accomplishment Thousand miles ain't nothing, girl. <laughs> Let me tell you, it is a lot, a long way to hike. So, did it? Did it? What did you feel when you got off? I had such a hard time because it did to me. It felt to me. It did feel like a failure, um, and it was hard to see to see it the other way around. Um, and I think I like to think that things happen for a reason, and I'm and sometimes it does kind of get into my head that maybe the reason that I did not finish is to get more comfortable with, with, with failure, not, and and also reframing it too, because if I look back at the maybe 20, 20 reasons that I went to do this hike with the exception of actually getting all, you know, 2194 point whatever miles. Yeah let's say the 19 other reasons I probably did accomplish them. It's a massive accomplishment. This is why I wanted to have you on the show. I, I, you know, funny enough, some, one of my listeners wrote to me recently, he said, you, you, you talk to through hikers. You don't talk to people who don't make it to the end. And then, then I, I already had you ready to talk to. And she actually <laughs> was a podcast of people who don't make it to the end, but I don't want any, anybody who doesn't do the, mm-hmm. doesn't do the full 2,100 miles, whatever, 2,200 miles, to feel that if they've done a thousand miles, I mean, if, if you'd stop on the approach trail, you're right. That's a massive failure. If you don't, you know, after two, or less than, you know, on a, if you stop on minus miles effectively, don't even get to Springer, that's a failure. But if you do a thousand miles, that's a massive accomplishment. And you should take, I think you should take pride in that personally. And I love the way, the spirit you used when you wrote that post, because that was encouraging to other people. You know, you wanted them to succeed. Like we always say, people, you know, you want other people to succeed almost as much as yourself. Yeah, so do. don't think that's a failure. Um, but you did send me a subsequent message, message after we spoke, volunteering your trail blunders and mistakes. I think you need to tell us a few of those trail blunders and mistakes then. <laughs> All right. Uh, well, I think the shoes were, was, was, that was a big one. The shoes. Clearly. Yeah. 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 The shoes, the lack of rain gear, but that was fixed very early on. As soon as I got to Neil's Gap, I got actual rain pants and a jacket. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, I think I did have my tent, these, but these aren't, these aren't things that like, and these aren't things that affected, I think, like the end of my hike, but I, I did have my tent kind of collapse on me in the wind a couple times. Well, yeah, yeah, that's okay, that's okay. 
<laughs> That's not nice. But you know what? It's not nice. It ain't the end of the world, though, is it? Yeah. You fix it. You put it, you know, it comes down, you put it back up again. You know, I, this this is such a – things that happen to you on the hike – just happen and you learn how to cope in my opinion you learn how to cope with them and you try not to do stupid things again i mean like the, the shoes thing hiking on bad shoes for 400 miles is not a good idea uh, and so certainly you needed to sort <laughs> those out before damascus how many other pairs of shoes did you get by the way before the end before you um only one more pretty much i one more and then i went to replace them shortly before i got off so right. the third okay. pair wasn't It'll be for future adventures. And in part of that post, now two months after you've got off trail, you wrote, I'm just now coming to terms with what is and what isn't. I've often said that we process this hike at different speeds. You know, things Mm -hmm. we realise things sometimes two years after the hike's over. What are your big takeaways from this adventure for you, Lauren, as as a person? You know, I feel like I could, I could... You know, I can indulge a little bit more on some of the things I already, I think some of the things I had actually already mentioned. So like uh-huh. failing at something is a skill or not meeting your goal is a skill because then you can, um, well, don't, not to hold yourself back to try new things because you're afraid of that because you don't uh-huh. like the way it feels or, you know, haven't learned to cope with that. Um, what else? You need, to can, fi- you need to fail to achieve anything. Yeah. You can't, you can't, not everybody does everything right first time. So you certainly need to have some yeah. sort of failure. But once again, I don't look at this failure too much. But I suppose the, the question I'm going to lead to, which I'm, I'll ask it now then, the quiet 30 year old <laughs> who never spoke up and looked at the granny public, wouldn't leave the house and mismatched clothes, did she return? Or Ooh. did, or did airbag become part of Lauren? I think. I think to some degree, mm-hmm. I, I did kind of embrace airbag into into daily life. I, I I feel like I have a little bit less fear of doing things that I, that used to scare me. I mean, I still get nervous about about things. I get nervous sure. about you know being on this podcast. I get nervous about. So do I. <laughs> so do I. It's about, this is about um, episode three hundred and fifty. Yeah, so but, it's okay. <laughs> yeah, but um. I think airbag would just kind of go for it. And that's. Yeah. She'd say, F it. let's get on with it. You know, yeah. yeah. Just don't worry about it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, and that bit of that you wrote about returning to the matrix, tell us about that and what you think you've learned about that. Because with a thousand miles under your belt, you've earned some post-trial depression. Now not getting to Katahdin doesn't mean say you don't get post-trial depression. You love that trail for a thousand miles. So, you know, there must be something you've earned that. So tell us about what it was like to be back you know, and how you felt after the tra- after the hike. Cause you finished two months ago, didn't you? So I, I've spent some time just like looking for answers on that. Like, why do I feel this way? Mm. I know part of it is that you, that became your daily life. And, and so it's a transition for sure. But there's mm-hmm. a lot of transitions where um, there's always something to look forward to. So I, and I thought to myself, why am I having such a hard time finding something to look forward to, even though I know there's definitely so much to look forward to sure. um, off the trail. Um, another common answer that um, we hear about is how you went on this life-changing adventure and you kind of come back into the world and in so, to some degree, it doesn't seem like there's been much, not much has changed no, back and everything's kind of the right, same, yeah, right? Yeah. Um, but I can't, and I can't, but I kind of came up with my own additional level. And I, I noticed that I was living this carefree life in the woods, this life of freedom and camaraderie and respect and simplicity. And I sort of, by getting off the trail, I traded that back for my, you know, uh, real world life, like back, back into society. Right. And, um, it's more complex, um, com- complexity, authority, greed. Um, there's like a co- there's competition, kind of like a scarcity mindset. Sometimes sure. um, you're get you're getting kind of bombarded with advertisements. There's these long drawn out procedures to do certain things. And I started to think, well, on the trail, 
you you deal with people face to face, things are simpler, people are good to each other, everyone wants each other to succeed. Um, but I think that we, we've built in all of these, whether it's yeah, procedures, rules, all of this stuff to try to help the world work more efficiently. But in some sense, it feels like we start to become a little bit ruled by them. We do. But the thing you mentioned in the note to me was that bad pe- there, are, there are too many bad people in the matrix, as you call it, and how bad people are, people are to each other. I don't, you don't think it's intentional. You don't get any of that on the trial, do you? you no, don't no. That on trial and I don't think it's intentional. I mean, some, there are obviously, like, bad things happen. But I think in general, people people want to be good to each other. But it's hard to speak through these systems that we have. We're not really, I don't know, focusing on just the human aspect of it. Yeah. Yeah, you know what? It, it, how it affects you is how it affects you, and and you don't need to explain it. I'm only I'm asking, asking the question because it's my it's mm. what I do. I ask people questions about it, but I, I, I can tell you, even though you know you feel it's more of a failure than accomplishment, I don't. I disagree with you entirely there. But I think you will find more things come out of this than you think will come out of it, and you'll continue to they'll sort of unfold in front of you as the years go on. Do you think you'll ever go again? Oh, um, so when I first got off the trail, I thought, "Hmm, I don't know, like, I don't know if I'm really cut out for this. (laughs) And after some time, all of a sudden you start thinking, well, you know, if I were to do it again, (laughs) I would do this and that. And, uh, you start thinking about it. Um, I think I will. I think, I think, I don't know when I don't have any set plans for it, but I think I will. Well, look, I'm, I'm, I, I'm, I'm so pleased. Um, I wrote to you because I th- it was such a positive message. I thought anyway, and and I think your generosity of spirit because you've gone off trail and yet you've had the generosity to write such a positive message to other people and and, and the impact it had on you. That I think that sort of stuff's important for people to see. You know, finishing after a thousand miles ain't the end of the world. You're still smiling when you're talking to me now. So you didn't die. No one got hurt. And, right. you, you, and you're good to go. So, look, I appreciate you coming on and telling us how it happened for you. And I wish you well. And if you do go again, let me know and we'll, we'll talk to you. All talk, right. We'll talk you through it then, okay? Yeah, it was an amazing experience. Thank you so much for having me. Good to talk to you. Take it easy, all right? You too. Bye. Take care. Bye. What a thoughtful, insightful young woman she is. Walking a, a thousand miles is no stroll, and I wanted her to know that it was an achievement in itself that she should be proud of herself. So many people go on these hikes and, for whatever reason, they're unable to get to the end. It's important to listen to your body and to know when and if you have to leave the trail. Lauren had an adventure, she met wonderful people, and she left on her own terms, having found inner qualities that she may have felt that she lacked. No shame in that, and I'm sure she's a better human having been out there. Now let's hear from our first Mighty Blue Class of 2023 fella. This is Steve Cordekamp, or, as you'll hear, Steve Dorr. So today's guest is Steve Cordkamp. Hey, Steve, how are you? Good, Steve. Good to see you. Good to talk to you. Well, you wrote to me uh, recently, said you're planning on starting on the 1st of March, which is going to be packed out with people on the 1st of March, and you're, you'd like to become one of the Mighty Blue Class of 2023. Tell us about yourself. Um, what have you been doing? Because uh, you're, you're like me, you're not in the first flush of youth, but you're not as old as me. So what, what's, your, what's your career been like? Uh, I just retired as a firefighter in Cincinnati. Uh, it finished up in August. And okay. since then, I've just been uh, training and getting ready for this this hike. So you're – it's funny, actually, because a lot of people wait till retirement till they get it done. Although recently on the show, we've had more and more people who didn't wait until retirement. What is your why? why what are you doing here? You know, do you, you realize how crazy this is, by the way. So tell us why you why you want to do it. Um, I've, this is something I wanted to do for a long, long time. Just, you know, raising kids, having a job, just didn't have the opportunity to, to take that much time off to, to do it. And now it's finally, you know, I've got free time and a, a wife that's willing to help me do it. And just, it's, uh, it's something I, I, I first saw the trail, gosh, I don't know, when I was a kid, my, my uncle lived in Oak Ridge, Tennessee, not far okay. from, from the right. Smokies. Right. And 
I've got a picture from Klingman's Dome with my father that I carry with me. Um, nice, back from nice. the, the, the late sixties when I was just a little kid and, uh, always knew about the trail and always wanted to try and, and, and do it. Now, I, I, we haven't talked about this before, so I, is your father still around, still with you or not still around? No, no, no. He died a long time ago. But you're going to take the picture with you on the trip, I, I presume, aren't you? Oh, oh yeah. It's on my phone. It's my, uh, my opening page to my phone. Oh man, that's going to be amazing for you when you when you summit. You look at his picture, you'll think this is what got me there. This is you know, my dad. He was he was an inspiration for me. That's that's fantastic. Um, so you're you've got this. And I'm looking in the background. Uh, listeners um, can't see. You've got this beautiful background with um, birds, uh, lots of bird hangers and so on. Birds flying around. Why do you want? Why, <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah. Why, why do you want to um, trade in this lovely comfort you appear to have right now for a bunch of bunch of months of misery in the woods? I I've always just loved being outside uh, for a long time. It's just. I don't know. I, my heart's really in the mountains. Uh, I went to school in Colorado and I really, you know, just came back to Cincinnati and met my wife and never went back to Colorado. So, right. right. (laughs) So your wife's catch you out the mountains. You know, you know. I know you're not saying that, but you're not, you're not blaming because you said she's supporting you. Um, and you said you're starting March the 1st. Why, why did you pick March the 1st? Um, I want to, well, I want to get done before she goes back to school. She's a school teacher. So she heads oh. back in the middle of August. Right. So I'm hoping to uh, finish up before then. So, you know, she can be at Katahdin at the base when I get done and, and That'd be, be there cool. with me. Yes. That's going to be cool. Yeah. So what is, so what is your actual hiking experience? You say you love the mountains. Do you go out as a day hiker, section hiker, or do you, have you done the other long distance hiking? Yeah. We, we I, I used to do a lot of backpacking before I got married and had kids yeah. and, uh, sure. And it, once we had kids, we did a lot of day hiking and we used to take our, our camper out west every year for a month in, uh, in the summertime and do day trips all over the west. And, nice. you know, all, all of our kids grew up with it. All right. Do so any of your kids want to come with you? Uh, my daughter does. Yeah. She actually majors in uh, outdoor education. So, Oh, wow. Fantastic. Yeah. She's uh she's surpassed her dad in, as far as ability. <laughs> she's <laughs> well, she's way you, she's way better outside than I am. Do you think she'll she'll come and spend some time on the trail with you? I think she will. I think she will. She she spent this last summer taking twelve year old girls on canoe trips through the Canadian wilderness for a week. Marvelous, marvelous. So, uh, in a summer her. camp. Good so, for her. Good yeah, for her. they. She's she's really good. So. What are you doing to actually prepare physically? You say you've been training for it. Um, and, you know, it, it, and, and you've, if you've listened to the show, and I know you obviously do listen to the show because you wrote to me about the show. Um, so if you listen to the show, you'll know that the, 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 the I always think the physicality you get, but obviously the better prepared you are, the better it's going to be for you. What have you actually been doing to make sure you're going to be physically fit enough? Um, in the past, I've always trained too hard too soon, so I'm building up slowly. Um, right. Walking every day, uh, I, every week I do a couple do- long days, right. and luckily there's a golf course right by my house. Cincinnati is a really hilly town. I know it's Ohio and everybody thinks it's flat, but <laughs> Cincinnati is very hilly. And the golf cart golf course in our local park closed down because it was too hilly. Oh, really? No wanted oh, to play oh, golf. God, that yeah. bad. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, nobody wanted to play golf there because you had to ride in a golf uh-huh. cart because it was too hilly to walk. And you oh, never had a level lie, so right. I, I go down there a lot. It's uh, they left the cart pass when they closed it, and they you right. know for people to walk on, and it's it's a uh, it's a good place to train. You going with a pack, or are you just walking, just generally? Walking? Yeah, I'm I'm doing a pack one day a week right now. The rest right. of the time, I'm just walking. But I, you know, I'm not not the spring chicken I used to be. So I, how, how old actually I, are you? I try to, I'm sixty. Just turned okay. sixty. Ah, uh, bad boy. <laughs> Mere boy, no, no problem at all. You, you'll be fine. And you were a firefighter, so I suspect there was a, there was a certain level of fitness you had to maintain to a degree as a firefighter. Oh, yeah. And yes, there was. So yes. Have you dropped weight since you were since you retired because of this training? Oh uh, yeah, yeah. Well, I had a, a shoulder replacement done in March, so right. 
when I did that, I gained uh, 20 pounds because I was sitting around and eating and enjoying life. And, <laughs> <That'll do it. laughs> and so I, I've lost that 20 pounds. So I'm hoping to so, lose about another 15 to 20 before I start the trail. That's cool. And give me that's a little cool. bumper zone there. And I know you've, um, a lot of people and whoever you've spoken to about the, the trail and certainly on a lot of the, on the YouTube rabbit holes, you tend to go down when you're preparing for this. There's a lot about the mental side of it as well. Have you considered that at all? Or is this something you think you're just going to sort of let it come to you and see what happens? Um, yeah, I've considered the mental, the mental part of it for sure. That's, uh, that's, that's going to be a hard, a hard way to go. I'm sure that, uh, being homesick, being away from the family, I'm used sure. to being home, away every, you know, 24 hours at a time when you're a firefighter yeah. then you're home for two days. But I, I'm sure being away from everybody is going to be hard. And will you have visitors? Um, yeah, I've got a lot of people have already uh, said they want to come down and, uh, and, and hike a week with me at a time or a few days and visit me. So I'm looking forward to that. I should warn you about that to a degree, you know, and I think we've said yeah. this on the show before. When some <laughs> once someone comes, you will not believe how phenomenally fit you'll become in about three months <laughs> once you've got started. Oh, yeah. And then someone joins you is is gasping for breath. You know, you want you want to be kind of careful about that. Don't invite too many people to stay a long time with you. Get some people who are yeah. fit enough to do it and make sure that, you know, they enjoy doing it as well. Yeah, I agree. What have you done about equipment? Are you, uh, have you got new stuff or are you using stuff you've accumulated over the years? Oh, no, I, I bought everything. I had everything bought last year. And then I, then I found out I had to have the shirt, the, the shoulder replacement. And so I had to postpone it for a year, but. Oh, right. Hang on. Yeah, so, I, so I didn't realize that you actually planned to, I'm looking at actually my notes now. Yes. You, you planned to do it last year and the, yeah, the shoulder, year, yeah. yeah. So the shoulder replacement put, put, put you back, but you, you come back again this year. So what gear did you Correct. buy? What, what sort of stuff have you got? What are you going to be using? Um, I'm, I'm, I have an Osprey ether, uh, plus 70 and I'm thinking about switching that out. It's a heavy pack. I'm um, uh -huh. thinking about going with a Z pack uh, just yeah. to save like five pounds. <laughs> but, it saves a yeah, lot. Five I, pounds is a lot. I tell you, if, if it's yeah. five million steps, you're saving five pounds every step. It adds up. <laughs> it does. It does. And that's what I'm thinking at. Right now, my base weight's about 25 pounds. So okay, uh, I, well. that would be nice to get to, to 20. But you know what? You, you have to be careful um, shedding too much in many ways. But there's things like, you know, uh, the the pack if you can shed weight from your pack that really helps you you know I, I, and i my first pack when i went in 2014 was five and a half pounds my z packs was 19 ounces i mean they're straight away yeah. a massive difference <laughs> and what about support then you, you say you're going to have people come and visit you are they going to help you with your resupplies well they how are you going to actually manage all, the, all this the resupply stuff that is quite a quite an issue to address on the trail yeah um the wife's going to help send some stuff out but for the first part Cincinnati is only about well, it's it, it's eight hours from from uh, Springer Mountain, right? So I, I'm hoping she'll come down like every couple of weeks on weekends and and see me and right. help me resupply. But right. for the first part, until we get farther north and too far away, but sure, uh, sure. the rest of the time she's going to mail stuff to me and I'm going to resupply it at the dollar stores and in the shops along the way. Well, you you may have heard I, I mentioned on on my show a couple of times that, that I. I was resupplied the first time by my my then wife, um, but the second time I was happy to go into stores and made sure I had no food in my pack when I was when I was going into town. That's a that's quite a fine you know, distinction to to work out. And that you will find sometimes that you get so much food, you you know you you start thinking, well, I, I need to ration this out a bit because you can't take you don't want ten days of food because that's just way too much sure. to carry. So you need to obviously think about that. And what about you going to cook or are you going to cold soak? What are you going to do? Uh, no, I'm going to cook. I tried cold soaking already a couple times and yeah, I'm a, I'm spoiled from being in the firehouses too long where we, we, we cook really well, really good food. So <laughs> but <if laughs> I kind of like my food warm. Your, some of your buddies should come out and give you the, bring you some fire, fire <laughs> uh, you know, fire and food. That'd be, that'd be kind of cool. And what are you most looking forward to when you're out there? What well, are there things that you've, you must've thought about this a lot over the time? Is it getting to Katahdin or is it getting to Springer? And what is the thing that's really floating your boat right now? Just the steps along the way. I've got some friends and relatives along the way that live along the trail and nice. And just to see them, I've got a friend in West Virginia and uh, relatives up in New York and 
you know, just the, the places, just really, I want to take it step by step. That's what I'm really looking forward to is just seeing each part of it. Yeah. Yeah. Every time I've recorded these people I'm speaking to, I'm jealous that I know they're starting and I know I'm not next, next year. And what do you, what are you least looking for? Is there something that you're either afraid of or you're concerned about? What are you least looking forward to? Um, probably just worrying about injury. That's the big thing, you know, just getting older and uh, just protecting my body. Just I, I really worry about hurt, hurting something and, and not being able to continue. That's the thing I worry about the most. Yeah. Well, you know what? The, the, the one, one thing about that is you can't do anything about it. You know, you either fall yeah. or you don't fall. And if you fall, I, I don't know whether you know, I used to I used to shout out the number of the fall I'd just taken. Once I realized, <laughs> firstly, I'd realized I wasn't dead. Secondly, I realized I could carry on. And then I'd shout out the number. So it, it was actually quite a good practice. I, I felt pretty good about doing that. And, and it always allowed me to get over these falls because there's no question about it. When you fall as a big guy, you know, as, as a, you know, I was a pretty solid bloke um, uh, when, when I first went, and second time, I guess. Um, when you fall, it, it does take an impact upon your confidence more than anything else, I think. So just regroup every time you fall. You will fall. Every time you fall, just regroup and make sure you, you're ready to go on and don't just rush it gotcha. because it, it will definitely come to you. And last thing is, are you have you thought about any trail names? Uh, yeah, I have a trail name that I got. Uh, we I used to do some rock climbing and right. we were on our way to Devil's Tower and we, I don't know if you ever heard of Wall Drug. It's a, a store out in the middle of South Dakota. No. And they advertise for hundreds of miles before you get there. It's a tourist trap, basically. Right. Sure. And there was a machine there, a strength machine, where you grab the bull by the horns and push them together. Right. And I did that. And my score was Stevedore, which is like Longshoreman. And nice. uh, so I got the name Stevedore back in 1980 when we were climbing Devil's Tower. So. Oh, I'll probably totally stick with that, that unless somebody yeah. else comes up with something better. Just remember, you don't have to accept it. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, look, man, look, I, 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 what I'd like if you're going March the 1st, I'd like to check in with you how your preparations are going in a, in a couple of weeks' time, but maybe a month's time or so. And we'll stay in touch okay. before you go. And then when you get going, we'll obviously try to stay in touch with what progress you're making. But uh, thanks for coming on board and being part of the Mighty Blue Class of 2023. Oh, thank you, Steve. It's great to talk to you. Good talk to you. Take it easy, okay? All right. Bye. Thank you. Bye. We've heard it time and again that life gets in the way, and I know that it does, yet many don't allow themselves to do this big dream for themselves. I know that not everybody can take that time out of their lives, but all I can say is that I've yet to meet anybody who has regretted taking that time and trying for that dream. It's definitely not easy. It's certainly not cheap. And it sure as hell makes you want to quit several times a day. But no one, literally no one, will tell you that it was all a waste of time. Steve was a fireman, so I'm sure he'll push through the tough times. You couldn't see his face, but he looked fired up to me. Thanks this week go to our lovely supporters. Since we last spoke, monthly donors Betty McInerney, John Krautler, Anne Pickin, Sean Deadwiley, Sharon James, Emmanuel Bravo Ramos, Alan Troy, Jessica Diaz have come up trumps again, while Sandra Bartlett, and Andrew Cohen have also donated this week. Thanks to all of you for keeping our shows coming. Don't forget, you can be part of our weekly thank yous with my eternal gratitude by heading over to our website at hikingradionetwork.com and clicking on one of the many donate buttons you're going to find there. Cheers, one and all. Finally today, George Stefanos has a growing realisation that the guy who started at Springer Mountain, Georgia, is not the same guy who's slogging through Virginia now. He knows the trail has changed him somehow. And in fact, he kind of prefers this version of himself. I'll see you next week. Thursday, the 30th of June, 1983, mile 813.6. High atop a shoulder of a mountain called the Priest, not far from the 4,063-foot summit, a spur ridge makes a perpendicular intersection with the main ridge crest. A large clearing surrounded by gnarled and rather sparse trees just below this junction is the site of the shelter where a large group of kids, three adult chaperones and one slightly used through hiker spend a night of rain, fog and unseasonable cold on the second to last day of June 1983.
A shallow little spring beside the shelter fed into a flat area, forming a small bog which grew by leaps and bounds during the night's monsoons. The elbow formed by the joining of the two ridges sheltered the structure from north, west and south winds. Ironically, the open end of the building faced the gap and a bitterly east blast howled through the night. Shivering was almost an enjoyable experience after all of the sweltering heat and humidity I've endured lately. A lingering chill drizzle greeted me at 6.30 this morning when I awoke. Having no fuel, I breakfasted upon those two cans of cold spaghetti which the kids had given me and started packing my gear. Slow work with all those sleeping bodies hemming me in. My backpack was finally loaded and I was decked out in all my rain gear at 7.45. My new friends were still asleep, so I left a sincere thank you in the register as I headed out on the trail. The long crest was very narrow, and the flanks fell away rather precipitously. I passed some promising viewpoints, but all were completely socked in, opening into a vast, wide void, swirling with light greys. The landscape was thick undergrowth, gnarled oaks and great boulder formations. I appeared to be following a thin, supernatural green land bridge through clouds. The half-mile climb up to the actual summit was followed by a four-mile descent into the Tai River Valley. The path was rocky and steep in many spots, the trail elevation dipping from 4,063 feet at the summit to 997 feet at the river crossing. The final viewpoint on the mountain was reached as I finally dropped below the clouds. I got one good photograph of a lush green valley speckled with daubs of white mist. Those kids had given me food and fire when I sorely needed them, but their most precious gift may have been the welcome piece of information that the store in Tyro, Virginia, had not gone out of business. I came out on Virginia 56, another major Blue Ridge crossing which was little more than a narrow, snaking roller coaster through rugged foothills. The Appalachian Trail crossed this road just at the point where it began to straighten out somewhat as the Thai River Valley was expanding from a narrow, wooded gorge into a broader farming plain. I turned right off the AT for the mile and a quarter hitch to Tyro. Only three cars passed me on that obscure rural highway. I wound up walking the entire distance, passing orchards, pastures and tidy little houses squeezed into a narrow strip alongside the river. I arrived at the store at 10.30. The place was small and had a limited stock of goods, but did carry fuel for my stove and a sufficient stock of solid food. The man behind the counter was friendly and funny, and even kept his own AT register behind the counter for all through hikers who stopped by. I made my purchases and headed outside to dig into some munchies. Once outside, I got into a conversation with a man who had been inside of the store keeping the owner company when I arrived. I'd wasted a lot of time trying to hitch a ride on that lightly travelled road on the way in and did not have any more to spare today getting back. I offered him some gas money for a ride to the AT. He refused my money but gave me the ride. On the way he informed me that the owner of the store had just buried his son that morning. He was such a pleasant gentleman you never would have guessed the pain he was in. It must have been rough for him to work today but I guess it would have been even tougher to sit around thinking. To a far lesser extent... Tonight and tomorrow morning would have been rough on me had he not opened the store. The food and especially the fuel I bought there saved my butt. Thank you, my friend. Back on the trail, the AT crossed the Thai River on a long suspension footbridge. Although sturdily constructed of stout timbers and thick wire cables, it would buck up and down in long undulating waves as a person crossed it. More so were he the depraved type of thrill-seeker who encouraged the effect with some rhythmic bouncing as he walked. Usually, I have a mild problem with heights, but for some reason, I was amused and entertained by this experience. I think this trail is warping my mind. In the next two and a half miles, the trail climbed about 1,200 feet and dipped slightly back down to the 1,800 foot elevation at Harpers Creek Shelter. I stopped for an hour. I was facing a three-mile climb back up to 3,870 feet atop Three Ridges Mountain, the last of a long series of grueling ascents in the National Forest lands between Cloverdale and Waynesboro. I read in the shelter register entry after entry by thru-hikers who were skipping this final climb by following a blue blaze side trail which visited some waterfalls and rejoined the Appalachian Trail on the other side of Three Ridges. The side trail was three miles shorter than the bypassed section of the AT. In those entries, hikers were raving about the falls, which northbounders had not yet even seen, and penning long passages about why they did not feel they were staining the integrity of their AT thru-hikes. I could certainly sympathise with that decision, and everybody has the right to hike their own trail, but the entries did amuse me. 
You would have thought the sidetrack went by Angel Falls by the way people went on and on praising its scenic wonders, while they glossed over the fact that they would be avoiding a difficult climb in the three extra miles on the AT. I left an entry of my own. All this babble about pretty waterfalls is horse. You're a bunch of stinking yellow b****. You climbed Grown Mountain and Pond Mountain and now you're wimping out on three ridges? You make me want to puke. I should personally slap each and every one of you. General George S. Patton. I followed the Appalachian Trail over three ridges. The climb was rough, probably the roughest of this long, hard week. The worst section was the steep one-mile ascent of the final and loftiest knob. The wide, clear path I had been following turned into a virtual bushwhack through shoulder-high weeds, rife with stinging nettle, still dripping from the past night's heavy rains. I was forced to wear my rain suit. Suddenly, as I attained the ridge crest, the trail became impeccable once again. It transformed from virtually non-existent into a wonderful four-foot-wide swathe through solid green walls of stinking weeds from one moment to the next. The remainder of the day was a breeze, ending with a two-mile descent to Morbin Field and the final shelter on the Appalachian Trail before Waynesborough. It was raining once again as I rolled in at 4.45, after 13 miles of hiking. I'd made decent time despite two hours in Tyro and an hour break at Harpers Creek. I could have continued and camped somewhere nearer to Waynesboro, now 17 miles away, but I didn't feel the need to prove anything more to myself today. I needed the rest after a tough week of hiking, and I hate tenting in the rain. June is over. I hiked 477 miles this month, a nice increase over the 336 miles I covered in May. In June, I averaged 15.9 miles per day, despite many difficulties with boots, shin splints, thunderstorms and the wall. I'm now only 11.4 miles shy of the 14 mile per day pace which I need to maintain over this entire hike, so I've made up almost all that ground this month. Tomorrow begins a new month, and soon I'll be out of Virginia. I'm beginning to see the first faint glimmerings of light at the end of the tunnel. I still use that mental image of my future self standing by that pond in Baxter State Park at dust, staring up at Catardon to psych myself up for some hard, fast miles when I'm feeling down. It has become so real to me that at times I feel like I'm walking in a dream and this vision is my only reality. I have no past before the Appalachian Trail and certainly no future beyond. I no longer seem to exist as an entity except in the here and now. Perhaps this was the hidden price which the weak, desperate man who began hiking this trail had to pay to get this close to his dream. I can barely remember him. I wonder how much of my present self will be lost if I can manage to pull off the remainder of this adventure. The fabric of time has been completely transformed on the Appalachian Trail. Tennessee was long ago. Georgia has become a fading memory of the distant past. My home in Connecticut is a faint, misty legend from the dawn of time. The future is even harder to comprehend. Catardon's a fairy tale. How can this long trail end? 1,324.9 miles to go. Kathy, I said as we boarded the Greyhound in Pittsburgh. Michigan seems like a dream to me now. From America by Paul Simon. Friday the 1st of July 1983, mile 830.6. It rained throughout the night upon the massive trees and lush ferns surrounding Morbin Field Shelter. The air hung still and leaden, cloaking the old forest in a shroud of dense fog and mystery. Something primeval in the atmosphere seemed conducive to my mind once again, wandering strange pathways. The rain petered out before dawn, but wisps of mist lingered into the morning, a faint, fading echo of the night's magic. Just above the shelter, in a sag along the crest, a flat, grassy swathe of Morpen Field lay hushed and dripping inside a thin, stationary cloud. The first mile and a half of the Appalachian Trail was pleasant walking. In Reed's Gap, the trail crossed meadows with views north and south along the ridge crest on either side of the small state road just east of its junction with the Blue Ridge Parkway. The AT followed the line of an old stone wall as it ascended the north field. The next 13 miles were no picnic. The path was constantly either 1. Overgrown with tall, rank weeds, 2. Very steep, 3. Rocky as hell, or 4. All of the above for most of those miles. Much of this section was sandwiched between the twin obstructions of the Blue Ridge Parkway and a huge development of vacation homes and condos along the ridge crest. The sun, which had been playing peekaboo with the fogs and mists since sunrise, emerged triumphant, 
combining with the lingering rainwater to gradually brew up a tropical mixture of wilting heat, stifling humidity and dripping vegetation. In order to avoid a thorough soaking from the soggy underbrush which frequently intruded upon the trail, and to protect my arms and legs from constant incursions of briars and stinging nettles, I had to wear my rain suit for most of the day. The greater portion of my hike was grim and joyless. There were some highlights along the way. A few nice views looked westward over the upper Shenandoah Valley. Those from the crest of Humpback Mountain were especially fine. A line of cliffs near the south summit overlooked a big chunk of the Shenandoah, as well as Rockfish Valley to the east and Wintergreen Development with its ski runs and summer homes to the south. Three Ridges Mountain and the Priest loomed in the background. The northern end of the hump, the mountain summit, had another line of cliffs and views of Waynesboro, and the surrounding sliver of the Shenandoah and a broad portion of the Rockfish Valley. To the north, beyond Rockfish Gap, the mountains of Shenandoah National Park stretched to the horizon. By the time I stood on that summit, the morning's mists had cleared just enough for me to enjoy the full extent of the views. The best views of Rockfish Valley came at the end of the day from Rockfish Gap, the major crossing of the Blue Ridge in Virginia. The Appalachian Trail followed the parkway on a bridge over Interstate 64 and US 250. Below to the east was a green, rolling country, rimmed by rugged-looking mountains on three sides. There were large swathes of grassland, snakes of forest, contoured fields of crops, scattered farm buildings, tiny meandering roads and a couple of villages. I climbed down to US 250 and began my hitch into Waynesboro. It was slow moving and sluggish all day, but I made the Waynesboro post office before it closed thanks to a nice little spurt at the end where I sucked it up and hiked the final three and a half miles in just over an hour and a hitch that lasted just 20 minutes before I obtained a ride. Waynesboro is another trail town with sharp contrasts, even more so than Cloverdale. Inside the city limits along Interstate 64, herds of cows roam wide green pastures, while a strip of huge smoking factories lined Virginia 624 and the railroad tracks along the west end of town. US 250 through town is similar to US 11 in Cloverdale, a bustling strip of motels, restaurants, gas stations and shopping malls. Unlike Cloverdale, Waynesboro is actually a small city with a very built-up downtown district of stores and offices. I got a room in a nice motel for only $22 because the air conditioning was not working properly. I took a long, hot shower, put on the clean clothes from my package and went out for some pizza. I now have my new hiking boots, along with some new shoulder straps for my backpack. The old ones were beginning to tear. I also have a ton of food for Shenandoah National Park. The springtime of my adventure has definitely come to an end. Somewhere on the line is segued into the beginnings of summer. All things must pass. Fulfilling its promise of a time of birth and growth, this spring saw the gradual emergence of a new man. Not a perfect one by any means, but he seems to be the man I was looking for. He faces challenges in a far different manner than the barely remembered man who began hiking this trail two months ago. He's had his baptism of fire and has met the wall and torn it down. More fires lie ahead, a furnace, blistering high summer in the lower elevations of the central Appalachians. A long, weary road still must be trod before autumn comes with its promise of reward. <laughs>